welcome to What Do You Think? So thank you. This is Pastor. Do we still call you Pastor? What did they call you now? Sarah or Pastor. Sarah May. <laughs> Pastor Sarah May. I don't I've know. known her uh, because she was our youth pastor for four years. Now she's the head chaplain over at Castle Memorial. And uh, I was going to be there in November for two weeks. And that all went uh, by the wayside today for a class. Anyway, so uh, Jim Brower, have you met Jim before? Sarah, is this the first time today? I feel like I know who you are, but I don't think we've met in person. Okay. So, so we were together in Illinois, and uh, he's been president there, president of Rocky Mountain, Bangladesh, mm -hmm. Philippines, and uh, now pastor at Tucson. Nice. So, as you can easily see, one year older than I am. <laughs> and uh, anyway, we started this thing together, uh, and, and we're getting to get people to watch. We're going to talk about church. We're going to talk about uh, your thoughts on the church and wherever else we want to go. So thank you. For those uh, of you that can't see, they're both in a bungalow with their background. So I just feel like I should point that out, that somehow they've managed that. Completely fake, yes. <laughs> anyway, we're going to have a little word of prayer and then we'll jump in. And the Father in heaven, we thank you for the chance to be with Sarah. Thank you for the years that we have had together. We pray that you'll bless her. We know that she's had to deal with pastoral chaplaincy stuff this afternoon and uh, was with someone as they passed. So we thank you for her ministry there and to us, and we pray that you will bless this conversation. We love the church with all its uh, good and all its challenges, and we pray that maybe something out of these conversations will be something that will help with our church here and around the world. So bless this time, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So if you don't know, where uh, it was just the three seconds uh, background, Ivory Coast, do I have that right? Yep. Moscow? Yep. Uh, into how far? Into nine, ten years old? Oh, I was, I moved to the States for high school. Oh, so I came back for high school? Yeah. Okay. No, Tacoma Park mm -hmm. uh, area. Yep. Parents yep. have been in Washington, yeah. D.C., Plum Union College, mother at the General Conference, Sabbath School. Just now retiring? I'm like right now retiring? Yeah. My mom's cleaning out her office this week at the GC. Um, <laughs> it's funny because they're closing all these chapters and it's like a weird history book of Adventism as they go through it because they've been with it. And, and, it it is, and to go through my files is like that. Just oh, yeah. Of my life. You know? mm -hmm. uh, anyway, we have kind of asked the last few weeks, uh, church, so... How do you feel about the church? Where is it headed? Triumphant, it's going to be terrific or worried a little. <laughs> Are you referring specifically to the Adventist church or churches in general? Yeah, the church. Yeah. Adventist church. Right, yeah. just clarifying. You know, I'm no longer a pastor of an Adventist church. I'm now a chaplain, so it's much of a <laughs> broader <laughs> scope. Um, sorry? We'll hope you'll have some insight for us anyway. We'll see. Um, you know, I've gone in a lot of waves um, with how church has played out over the last, I'd say, 20 years. And maybe that's just my cognitive years where I've been paying closer attention to the background as much as the foreground. Um, when you're a kid, you kind of go along with things. You do what your parents say with resentment or with joy, either way, depending on whether your friends and snacks are there. Um, as you get older, you start asking more questions. And then depending on your friends again, often that determines where you stand um, I think at church sometimes as well, um, and depending on also who your influencers are. And then for me, as I've gotten older, I think I've become more confused and more invested simultaneously as time has gone on. It's a mashup. Yeah, well, it's just, it's just fascinating to me because it's like there's so many moments where I'm like, I know too much now, and I know the murky ends of it, but then it's almost like, but those are things that I think we can fix. And then I get more determined or like, I'm like, oh, there's so much that could still come out of this, like truth and the baseline still there. Um, and I just feel like there's a lot of fragments that are just distracting from the actual point of church and the actual point of Adventism and religious status in general. Tease those out, uh, truth and baseline, uh, core basic doctrines, God, Jesus, love. Yeah. And, and I think, like, I've been reminded in the past um, by one of my 
uncles who has often mentioned that the definite article in truth actually really matters, whether it's the truth or a truth. Mm. Um, and that's always been kind of a pivotal thought process for me when I am about to go to war with something in my mind. Is this a truth or is this the truth? And am I reacting to something that is someone's opinion or something that they're saying is the foundation of church? Um, and I think for me, I have to kind of keep allocating and moving that mindset kind of around so that way I don't get so confused on things that aren't the actual conversation or aren't the actual struggle. Um, because for me, it's easy. I, I think I tend to live more passionately than I like to admit to. I react to things and I care too much or I care too little. Um, and I think it's very easy for me to get caught up in one thing that was said that upset me and I go down a spiral and then I fixate on that. And that's why the church is burning, you know? <laughs> and then like I end in this like hovel of a mess, right? Um, but the reality is, is like I have to check myself as a person who has dedicated their life and much of their academic experience to religion and to Adventism and say like, okay, is this a truth I'm fighting for? Is it the truth I'm fighting for? And if I can make sure to differentiate between those two things, then typically it helps me be a better moral compass. I'm going to give a couple of examples just so everyone knows exactly what you're thinking of. Sure. I mean, depends how honest you want me to be, but I mean, things as simple as like coffee and jewelry, you know, where I grew up, you are no longer Adventist. If you do either, like have your ears pierced and you drink a cup of coffee and God forbid you eat out on Sabbath. Um, and all of these are like very trivial things to some people, but very revolutionary and intense and critical law abiding things to other people. And to realize cultural context is huge, along with maybe just other people's reality, maybe for them, this is what they need in order for it to be a healthy relationship. But other people, it is not what they need. And they need that freedom to be able to be a bit more human and to be able to have that cup of coffee while they read their Bible or do whatever they're doing. And I think for me, sometimes it's easy when someone will say something without thinking, saying like, well, you know, like, obviously, when you become a good Christian or a good Seventh-day Adventist, these things will just disappear into the background because you're now holy and you're good. Um, and I'm sitting there like, so should I not be drinking the coffee while you tell me this? <laughs> you know, like, as I'm sitting there, like, I love Jesus and drinking coffee, you know? And it's like this, this weird dichotomy that I find myself in with these very trivial things. And then other things like, I mean, as a woman in ministry, um, you remember, Dan, when I was being ordained, I went through a whole conflict of my, so much of my family and the people I care about are on the opposing end of women's ordination. To me, it doesn't actually matter. Like for me, I'm like, I think God's cool. I think people are great. And I like the mashup of those two things. And no matter how many times I quit ministry, I end up back in it. So clearly this is just something that we're gonna do now, right? I don't know if I need to be ordained. I don't really care if I'm ordained um, because I feel like if you're doing what you love to do, then you're just gonna do it whether you have a title or not, right? So like, that's kind of my stance. But I remember you wisely telling me like, hey, but this isn't always about you. And I remember being like, huh, like that's an interesting reality. Like in my head, my ordination was absolutely about me. <laughs> but you pointed out like there's a bigger conversation happening. And there's also, you know, I'm a chaplain in order to be board, um, board certified as a chaplain. Like these are things that play in. And it was a little bit of a reality check for me to say like, oh, like this is a bigger scope. This is no longer even about me like getting whatever recognition that maybe I, I've worked towards, um, but rather it's uh, opening up a conversation and saying like, hey, like there's a lot of good that can come from ordination, but it's not the end all. And we so- This is what we see about you. Whether right. you want to hear it or not, or need to hear it or not, we want to say this to you. That's, I mean, yeah. that's what I meant by saying it wasn't all about you. Your yeah. family wants to say, we see you doing ministry and called of God, yeah. We would like to have this chance to say that to you. Uh, yeah. Whether you need it or not, that may be another another question. Well, affirmation is always beautiful. And being recognized for things, being celebrated for things, absolutely. I don't know a person that doesn't secretly love that, even if they claim they don't. Okay, so let's just be real with that. Um, having said that, there is a level for me that, like, I was raised where, sounds awful, but women often stood to the side of the pulpit because the pulpit 
was the holy place. <laughs> you know what I mean? And really? I remember, I remember America seeing, or overseas. Well, both. Like I remember at a church being asked to not preach at the main pulpit. They asked me to preach, which was a thing. And then they handed me a music stand and I had to use the music stand beside the pulpit, which honestly didn't bother me because pulpits kind of freak me out anyways. Um, and I feel like I don't know what hand motion to do. And I just like, it's just a weird space for me. But at the same time, like I didn't even think too much of it until I got off stage and I was like, that was weird, wasn't it? <laughs> like the fact that literally they set up a side pulpit. <laughs> just for a little anecdote, Jim, I wrote this in, in my book yesterday. I was talking about open doors and closed doors. And do you remember when in front of 7,000 people, my computer froze <laughs> and you had to get up and reboot it, trying to hide behind the pulpit the whole time, squatting mm -hmm. while I'm keep preaching, get it going and it went advance on its own and you had to sit there and squash and push it oh, and just man. serve serve jesus i mean we just we were melting down in front of seven thousand people it was hot it was the philippines or was it yeah. and then the yeah. and then we went from there where you were a, an amazing gift to us and to me and we went to the pool where they wouldn't let you baptize yeah you remember that we're all lined up and yeah. you couldn't do it the but iron you know, there's a door closed. You know. But you know what the beautiful thing about that is, is I got to be the person they hugged when they came out of the water. <laughs> so I feel like in a weird way, the pressure was off and I got to do the best part because when they're up there with you guys being dunked, there's so much <sighs> happening. And then when it's done, there's this relief. And then I got to hug them. <laughs> so everybody won. <laughs> but yeah, it's a weird... The church, should, the church should make a bigger distinction between essentials and non-essentials and your words are a truth and the truth well and i think also like when it goes to something like that i mean i don't want to beat a dead horse there's always going to be two sides to this argument and i don't like the train wreck and the like just the crap it leaves behind like there's so much stuff that goes along with this conversation um, and I think it's just taking all the focus away from being a kind person and hearing other people and moving forward in whatever it is that you're passionate about and care about. And for me, it becomes a really tough spot because I get, I don't know if I should say this, but I get criticism from both sides. One is you don't speak out enough and you have been ordained and you have, you know, been successful in ministry and you have done these things. So you should stand up and use your pulpit or your voice and like say, this is why you should ordain women. Um, and then there's the other side that's like, thank you for not doing that because it helps us see like that you can just do ministry because you like ministry and it's not all about a mission, like a goal of winning people over to your side of the argument. And I've always kind of struggled with that tension to be completely honest. And I think it's so easy to get distracted. And I know for me, I've lost so many friends to the church, not to me. I, I'm very fortunate not to have lost friends over this conversation, even if we like wholeheartedly disagree with each other, but I've lost friends to the church like they don't have any respect for the church anymore um, on that one issue mainly on a lot of issues but i think that was the nail that sealed the coffin talk about like some of the was, others. what other issues have your generation just said i can't go there uh, i mean i think all I think all the, what we would consider taboo or buzzwords of the last 20 years, so homosexuality, like being transgender, all of those things, supporting people, um, gay marriage, gay rights, all of those topics that I think, you know, as soon as you start telling people they can't care or love for each other, I think that's going to push some people away. Um, I think that issue of women's ordination, I think even just the issue of like what it means to actually go to church and be part of church and how church is supposed to look, you know, they get condemned for coming in in jeans and then other churches go and they're like, Oh, you can wear whatever. And then it's like a cool hipster church, but then no one else feels like they can be part of that church because they want to dress up for <laughs> church. And so then we are creating these weird alienating moments um, where no one knows, like you would have to either be all in on this type um, or all in on this other type. And, in the attempt of being open and caring for all people, sometimes we also alienate. So I think like there's this constant struggle for people to be able to find their place. And especially within a system 
that is more dogmatic than they intend to be, um, I think it comes out. I mean, as soon as you have that many rules and regulations and strong opinions, and we've always done it this way, um, and people that have sacrificed their whole life for the Lord in the name of Adventism, um, it's going to hurt when a young person says, I don't see it. And I don't care about that thing that you've been on a mission to save, you know? Um, and that's going to create that. I'm sorry, go ahead. Are they saying that they could keep the whole package of the Adventist beliefs that we have if we were more inclusive and and embracing and welcoming, they could live with all the rest of it? Or are there some message things we would have to tweak too? So here's the thing. I think that's a trick question <laughs> because I think redefining, so one of the things I've been struggling with is redefining spirituality. Like what does spirituality mean to me? And when people say like, hey, Sarah is a chaplain or Sarah is a pastor, what people come up with in their head immediately is bizarre. Um, but the reality of what I do and what I spend most of my time doing is not these rules and regulations. It's being present with people, hearing their narrative, sharing another narrative and saying, you know, there's hope and grace out there. So don't give up, you know, like that kind of thing. And here's real life, tangible things, coping mechanisms to get you to the next step. But instead, what I think a lot of religions have become is, is a history book. And they're like, well, we've always done it that way. And it's like, telling a kid like a curious kid that's asking all the thousand questions because they want to learn and they want to grow and they want to be excited and you're saying like well why is this happening what's happening over here and saying I don't know or because I said so or it's cool and not giving them the adult explanation of why it's cool um and I can only use my nieces as an example. One of my favorite part of them is, is that they're super curious and they ask 3,000 questions. But my favorite thing is, is that my whole family answers every question. Um, and sometimes it's huge words and they're just like, oh, it sends us as what? You know, or like they're going down these things. Um, and I, I'll still remember my littlest niece, she came out one day and she had all these things and I, she was like looked like she was about to drop everything she had everything in her arms that she could possibly carry and I was like what's going on over there and she was like auntie I'm establishing a process <laughs> and she was like four and I was like you do you girl you do you and in my head I was so glad because a four-year-old had the cognitive ability to use one words beyond her age but also the ability to say like this is my space this is my process and this is what i'm doing um and there was no fear in that and i think if she had been brought up where like everything had to be regimented and everything had to be so curated and perfect um and maybe the questions weren't answered i think she would have been afraid to do that um and now you have two firecracker little girls that will ask a billion questions and be wise beyond their years um, and more adaptable than most people are. Um, and I think being open is a huge part of that. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead, Jim. Uh, so do you scare your parents and the older generation to death? Because what, what I hear from you and your generation is uh -huh. that you're done with all the stuff, okay? Uh -huh. Authenticity, you want real relationships. Mm -hmm. Now, what hasn't emerged is an avenous version that has formed, okay? And too often we simply keep fighting against all the stuff, yep. but we haven't really formed an authentic community that is done with stuff, but fully alive in Jesus. Right. Wow. So we're done. <laughs> that no, was the time. No, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Dan and I have the white hair. You no. have the brown hair. No, no. So, oh my word. This is one of those things that could go on forever. Um, I have been so fortunate because even though I think my parents may be more traditional and Adventist approved right. than I am, um, I have been blessed by a bunch of people that no matter how many renegade side adventures I go on, somehow have been able to have a conversation with me. Um, and I can only use Garden Grove as a great example. I was there for a little over four years, I think, or around four years. And 
I went down how many weird roads and somehow we always ended back with grace and love and like, hey, we're a community, we're gonna figure this out together. And so even the moments where I was like, what does anything mean, you know? And like, <laughs> what are the core principles of actual Adventism? You know, if Jesus was anti-establishment and broke down the walls of synagogues, like, do we need a physical structure for church? And Dan and them are sitting there like looking at me like, I mean, yes, <laughs> to some extent. But I think the beauty, in I hear the word authentic, I hear the word relevant, I hear the word um, welcoming, you know, like a safe space, you know, and I hear all these things and those are beautiful words. And they, I think, are what everyone wants every age. I don't think that's new to this generation. I think the challenge with this generation is, is that I think it's the pendulum swing that constantly happens between generations. So you'll have like a very traditional generation and then you have the generation reacting to the traditional generation and then back and forth and you keep swinging too far in either direction as opposed to finding the center and then by not finding the center which I think is it's a reactionary plan it's not a forward-thinking plan everything is reactionary um, I think because of that you no longer have that safe space and even though that may be a buzzword I think feeling safe in your curiosity is the most important part and for me, I was fortunate to have teachers and people in my life that I could say like, well, what if Adventism is lame and not real? Like, what if we've, my whole life, I've been a missionary kid and a pastor's kid. We've gone around the world and told people, this is truth. What if we're wrong, you know? And like, that becomes a very quick question to me because like, if we're wrong, I'd prefer to just know now and I, you know, and we can just move on from this whole shebang. The but that's what I heard one day was, uh, you said one time, I thought, I'm, once in a while, I'm a Hindu for a day. Yeah, for sure. There are days I'm Buddhist, there are days I'm Hindu, I'm over it. I'm like, <laughs> Jesus is still cool, but the other people involved are stressing me out. <laughs> so I'm going to go zen out in a corner, <laughs> do some art, <laughs> and hang out. From the disciples. Yeah. <laughs> Which, um, uh, Jim, you, I don't know if you know, her godfather is Uncle Ted Wilson, because they were missionaries together in Ivory Coast right. and in Moscow. Uh -huh. So if you had a week to go backpacking with him, uh, at the end of the week, you would wish he would, what, make a proclamation that, that all questions are safe and no questions is out of bounds, you want him to say uh, all expressions of gender and sexuality are, are there's room for you in our church? What, what do you wish he would say that would help keep your friends in the church? So I think that's a, a really loaded question because I think yeah. Uncle Ted as my uncle version and Uncle Ted as president can't be the same person. The thing I will say is, is I've never not felt supported by him, personally. Um, the church stance, I've been frustrated and hurt and yes, shed a tear or two over, but actually never really for me. Again, because I don't think much of my identity is actually hinged on an establishment, which sounds maybe, again, anti-establishment, but because so little of my worth is hinged off of that. Um, no matter how important it is, that's just not something that my brain needs to function. Um, for me, it's purpose and making sure that my friends have a safe place to go. So if I don't, don't want to lose them. They're good people. I have been with young ladies this week who we've lost, and it's heartbreaking yeah. for me. Yeah. Said, what can we say? What can we say globally? What can we say at a local church? I mean, there are a few churches that have sort of said we are a safe church or we are an accepting church or we are whatever you want to call it mm -hmm. but as a world church we haven't said any of those things well and i think that's also a challenge because like honestly we've had some real conversations in the past not recently but in the past um as a you know unit of people um and we know we land on different sides of this and i think there's you know it's a really hard place to be when you love someone so much and you disagree so wholeheartedly yeah, well, i don't but, want to personalize it it was just a way to try to get to the question but. but i think what i think there is a point though i think that um i don't want to lose people either 
And I think the problem is that when you're faced with a group of people that are on such far spectrums from each other, again, this is that pendulum swing, you go internationally to some places and they're way over here because we taught them to be way over here. Um, and then over here, we've decided it's suddenly okay again. Um, and so they're still over here. And if you think, okay, let's approve all of these over here, you're gonna lose people over here now. And so I think there's this constant Again, it goes back to that tension of what is the actual goal of Adventism? And that's where I've landed constantly. It's not even about like, do I even fit in anymore? It's more along the lines of like, what is the actual goal? And if I can get behind the actual goal, like if there's a clear vision, I think people can get behind that. But I think right now the vision has been so murkied and muddied by all the other things that no one even knows what we're here for. Are we just another How church? Would you that yourself? Sorry? How would you answer that yourself? What you say? Well, see, I think as one of the people that had probably muddied the waters, <laughs> <laughs> it makes it a little difficult for me to be able to say clearly because I think that's, that's what I'm struggling with. I think like if you think about true Adventism at its core, they were the people you know, Ellen White was at the forefront of a whole bunch of stuff. Um, they were the ones that were cheering for equal um, equality and people being able to have fair treatment. They were the one on the front of social justice. They were the one expanding that roof of the church and saying, all are welcome. We're not like the other ones that are condemning you and saying you have to change. We're the ones that are admitting that Jesus is love and that love goes further than all of these other dogmatic rules. And that's why Adventism is beautiful. Adventism was healing. Adventism was the renegade belief system. And then suddenly, somewhere along the way, because it got written down somewhere, people suddenly said, oh, things have been written down. Now we have to enforce these things that were written down. And as soon as you get to that point and you lose focus of the the whole goal of Adventism, of pushing the envelope, of stepping out because justice is important and caring for people is important and following the actual life of Jesus is important rather than the rules that were set up and in place to be able to create a physical structure. That's when Adventism is healing. And that's when religion and when organized belief systems are healing is when they're able to push those envelopes, step beyond the bounds, almost leap off of that cliff, knowing that there's something safe out there, even though they can't see it. But what has happened is, is that they want to make sure the, the bridge is built and everything is in place and all the safety harnesses are good. And that's great, but it's not going to be for everyone then because no one's going to agree on what the bridge is supposed to look like. No one's going to agree on what the safety harnesses need to be and no one's going to agree on how to even get across that bridge. So now you're just stopped. <laughs> and like for me, that's a really, really annoying place to be. And I think right now we have stagnatized. I don't, I was talking to someone who's Buddhist and was saying like, they're like, well, what has your church done recently? And I was like, and I honestly didn't know how to answer <laughs> because on all the big issues, we're still fighting over women and homosexuality and jewelry and coffee, <laughs> you know, like, I don't know what we've done that's helped the actual community. There's all these amazing small initiatives and there's these amazing concepts out there but I was like I don't know if I could speak to like an active thing that is create like created that revolutionary step that people can buy into um, so and supercharge people. Brian McLaren talking about hunting the field mice versus tigers. Yeah Jim? exactly. So Sorry, are God. you saying the church has basically become irrelevant? I think if we don't do something soon it will be. I think so it's quickly a losing. A glimmer of hope for it. I think there's a glimmer of hope. And honestly, I think the accessibility right now, and I know the rest of the world has started to open up, but Hawaii hasn't. And so a lot of everything is really still mostly digital. Um, churches are open, but not fully. Um, and so it's been interesting because I was asking a whole bunch of friends, like when was the last time you went to church? And most people say February or March. Mm -hmm. And I, my weird brain was like, this is a gold mine for so many people that love technology. Like you can get people to be part of your church and your community from anywhere in the world right now, because now all of these digital communication devices are set up so that way you can be part of any community you want to. And instead people are not finding relevant hope on a digital platform. 
And so they're like, what's the point of church? I can at least go to the beach and feel peace. I can at least go hang out with my two friends because it's a group of five or less and find community. Um, and they're starting to realize that maybe the church hasn't been actually filling them up and it's been more of a tradition they've done. And so my fear is, is that if we don't do something relevant soon and, or maybe clarify the actual purpose of church and community, um, I think it's going to be hard for people to be part of because it's such a mess globally right now. It's interesting that, uh, you know, you know, Tom Neslin died, mm -hmm. our head elder, and, and Gunda hadn't been in a church. His favorite people. And Gunda hadn't been in a church for two years mm -hmm. because he was sick. So they wanted to know where I was speaking, and even though there was no church people there, mm -hmm. they came with the musicians, Savino and Melissa, just to sit in this empty church, just to feel part of church again. So there is, there is something to that. Yeah. And to be with community. But Hilda has talked about how easy it will be for people to just stay in the bathroom and watch. Oh. How many people are watching Loma Linda? You know, I mean, they're just wherever your church is, but you're watching Loma Linda. Well, absolutely. And I think that's why I'm saying, like, I think it's, it's not in a great space. I think it was already not in a great space. And then this made it even more like, well, literally I was going out of tradition. And now that tradition and repetition has stopped because now we've not had to go for six to eight months. Um, and so if there's nothing really relevant happening and you're finding your relevance and your purpose somewhere else, why go back? I mean, my friends would much prefer to go build a house for someone down the street or help someone clean their yard out or do highway cleanup. They prefer to do that than go to church because at least that's a practical thing that they can get behind and they know why they're doing it. Um, and I think that's been one of the biggest challenges is, is that we've, we haven't taught people why as well as I think we could have. You have an answer for that, Jim? Oh, I don't have any, I, I'm, this is a question, all right? Oh, and uh, yes, and I, I want to put you a little bit on the spot because oh, I'm there are sorry. Lots, lots, lots of social agenda, okay? What I haven't heard from you is um, where does Jesus fit and the gospel of what Jesus actually brought that mm -hmm. is absolutely transforming. Is that part of your generation? Is that important? Uh, where does that fit? That is different than Buddhist, Hindu, etc. Because mm -hmm. I agree with you. I wish that we acted more like Buddhists and Hindu and Muslims. And because I'm a child of the world as well, we all three of our uh, mm -hmm. us are. But the part that nobody else has, as C.S. Lewis said, was grace. Right. Okay. That's the missing ingredient in all the religions of the world is grace. Right. But then when you're introduced to a very rule abiding, grace filled church, sometimes no, so grace is used grace as a absent, weapon. <laughs> grace absent church. Okay. So I, I think one of the, I have a lot of random opinions about things, but I think one of the high horses that I tend to jump on is, is that when I studied theology, again, I was trying to decide what I believed in, whether I had been traveling the world sharing this message and if I believed in it because I didn't want to become a 50 year old and then regret my whole life. So that was kind of like, I don't want to regret things. And as I studied theology and world religions more, I started realizing that the thing that I love about Christianity is really just Jesus. Um, I wish I was like more on board with what day of the week is critical and how you know, we eat and all of, you know, like these different practices and this will make you a good and holy person and this will not. But for me, I think the thing I just absolutely adored was that Jesus was a real person in the sense of he entered all the different spaces, no matter how disturbing they were. He was never afraid to go into the darkest and weirdest alley or darkest and weirdest conversation. He met people where they were at. He had no intense, ridiculous expectations of them that would set them up for failure at the very beginning of the conversation. And he would pull them out from their own dismay and disaster that they created and said, hey, there's still hope for you. Don't give up on yourself. And I think for me, that version of Jesus that wasn't afraid of all of the things that every other person seemed to be so concerned about, um, that was cool. And for me, 
that's why I always had a problem. I was like, you know, so much of the New Testament is Jesus breaking down walls. He's saying like, you've set up these parameters for success. You've set up these parameters of what is truth. You've set up these parameters of how to worship and all of them are false, all of them, because that's not the point. They're helpful. They might've been useful at a point, but that's not the point of grace and story and Jesus and salvation and yes, the Christian movement. And the other thing is, is I think like, if you look at how it transpired after Jesus died and like how everything happened, people took ownership of it. They had their own versions of it. They did it in the space they were comfortable with. There wasn't this crazy dress code of, if you don't do this, you're not going to fit in. It was like, hey, we're having food. You want food? We're going to talk about Jesus. <laughs> you know, like It was like this very authentic space where people could come and truly be whoever they were. And there was no disillusion about who they were. And I think we've, we've created these huge templates and these huge we like to say that we're open to people being broken, but as soon as we have a meth addict come into our church, we throw our hands up and we're like, I don't know what to do. I told them to pray about it. I gave them options, but they're a freaking meth addict. Of course, they're going to have a hard time coming off of that. Like, it's just, we, we freak ourselves out because we want to be that mirror of Jesus. But the reality is we've never been trained to be that mirror of Jesus because we've always had our rules and our regulations to hide behind. And so now that you have a generation saying like, hey, we want the church to be safe for everybody. Let me bring all of my gay pride friends in and sit in the front row during gay pride month, the rest of the church is going to freak out because they don't know that's not church to them. That's not what they've seen church be over history. And that's completely understandable on both ends. But the thing that bums me out is, is we keep saying that we're that and we're not allowing it to actually happen. And I think Jesus was the perfect example of that. He was ostracized in his own space because he was saying, Hey, there's so much more to this than these rules and regulations and these methods of doing things. And he did things intentionally to push those envelopes. Let me heal someone on the holy day because this is bigger than work. This is about healing someone. Um, and like you just go through all these steps and every step that Jesus did was breaking a stigma. Let me bring someone back from the dead. Dead is unclean, you know? Let me go bring them back to life and then welcome them into my arms. And he kept breaking all of those stigmas. So then soon the people that followed him and were around him got a little softened to the shock of it all. And so then when they were sent out to go experience and just express and share who Jesus is and the truth that they found, there was no longer that discomfort. And I think you just have to break through that discomfort. And once you get to the other side, you start realizing we're all, we all have bad days. We all have great days. We all have struggles. Um, and we're actually all on a pretty equal playing field. I have a lot of yeah. tangents. Stop me at any point, guys. Now, so you got the G's there, Jim, did that. Did that check that box? Um, I, yes, I go it, it did. Uh, it sounds like you've read Ortberg's book, Who Is This Man? That's such I'm a not. good book. Oh, you, 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 I'll you, put it on my list. <laughs> oh, yeah. He'll give you a whole bunch more areas that Jesus just blew things up. It's a great yeah. book. Yeah. Uh, so, wow. Yeah, I like listening to you. I love your energy. <laughs> just... I ramble a lot, guys. It's really intense. Please edit this. <laughs> Not a chance. Oh, no. Um, but to answer your question more, um, as I'm getting older and maybe lazier, um, I've started to realize I appreciate <laughs> some of the rules that have been established because it gives me permission. It sounds horrible, but to not do certain things. So my renegade self used to always be like, you know, I give, this is awful probably, but I give, you know, my tithe, but I also give 10% of my time to community or other people or whatever. So like making sure I do that. And I have learned um, that sometimes you don't have to do both because also giving yourself time is just as important. You know, Sabbath, the concept of Sabbath and resting and doing those things. So for years, Dan knows this, I'd be like, let's go 3,000 miles per hour constantly because I owe all of this stuff to humanity and to the church and to all these people. Um, and then I remind myself, like, Jesus rested. And I have to take that moment, and I'm terrible at it, but I'm, that's one of the things I'm working at is saying, like, okay, Jesus as this person that I've modeled most of my life off of. Um, and I've told people all the time, even if I found out one day Jesus was not the Messiah, I would still be down to be his follower. Because I think he is just such an incredible example 
of how to be a good person um, and how to be grace-filled and how to encompass all things wonderful. Um, and so I was like, you can pin me in all these different corners, but the reality is, is like, I like the model that he set. And then for me to sit back and say like, okay, this person is someone I've spent a lot of my life studying and getting to know. And this person who I think is just a superhero and can do anything needed rest. Like I need permission to do that as well. And so there's moments of Adventism where I'm like, can't, Seventh-day Adventist, gotta dig it up. <laughs> I'm gonna go rest in the corner. <laughs> Even though there's this movement I should be part of. So, you know, there's these moments of permission that I think the establishment and organization has set up for me. But I think it gets really dangerous when parameters are set so far in stone to go back to the original thing. I think it alienates a lot of people and I think it makes it really hard if you feel like you don't check all of the boxes to be able to come in. Um, and especially if, if you guys look, I mean, we're all pastors here. If you look at what we have to ask sometimes people before they get baptized, I'm not saying I disagree with it, but sometimes I disagree with how it's presented. Um, and when you go through and you're like, do you do you're this? You're talking to two heretics. You're talking to two heretics here. Right. <laughs> Yeah, and so it's like, it gets really awkward because it's like, is that the most important thing though? Like, do you love Jesus? Do you want to like dedicate your life to being a, you know, the curiosity of God and the universe and caring for other people? Cool, let's get baptized because that's the message. Jesus didn't do like a 28 fundamental beliefs check off to make sure they said, I do believe to each single one before he baptized people. People just wandered in and he was like, do you? promise to love God and love each other. Yeah, good. <laughs> you know, step one, you know, and I think like we've spent so much time doing the checklist that it's alienated people from being able to feel like they can be part of it. Because they're like that one, I just don't know if I can say I'm there yet. And then they have to wait. And then it becomes harder and harder for them to want to come back to it because no one went after them. I and I just, I think we've, we've made it harder for people to be able to be part of the conversation. And Acts 15 says we should make it easier. Don't make mm -hmm. it difficult for people to come to Jesus. Yeah. And I'll say the best conversations I ever had um, were always with people that should never have had a spiritual conversation with me or a religious conversation with me. I remember one night in Washington, D.C., I was journaling and I was sitting at the reflection pool. I was trying to write a paper for, I think, my ethics course or something like that. And couple guys who were clearly on something came out and they're like, dude, what are you doing? And we had this whole conversation and it ended with this most beautiful existential like narrative of humanity. And I was sitting there and I was just staring at them and I was like, I feel so re-energized and ready to face the world. Like I couldn't explain it. And it's because they were just so real. They talked about how broken and how low life got sometimes. They talked about the people that lifted them up. They talked about like how there has to be something in the universe. We're not sure if it's God, but there's got to be something out there that's like helping and giving good energy to them. And it's this whole conversation. And it's like just these beautiful, beautiful pieces of where I think God is. And we get freaked out when it's not labeled the way we label it. Real was the main common denominator there. The yeah. Principle. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And there's a lot of, I mean, even within Christian denominations outside of Adventism, you know, they may not look like an Adventist looks, right? You know, I remember meeting my first youth pastor outside of Adventism that had like tattoos all over his arm and was like an, in the rock band, you know, like super cool dude. And I was like, oh, I, don't, I don't think that's right. <laughs> you know, I'm a little missionary kid that just came from like Moscow, Russia, super confused. And he explained Jesus so much more passionately than anyone I had ever experienced. And I was like, cause he got him and he understood the message, not the rules. Um, and I think that's, I think people just want to be able to buy into the conversation. And I think we've not allowed people to buy into the conversation or be part of the conversation. Here's, here's a theory of mine, react to it. Okay. I hear a lot of, people your age, people my age, still reacting and pushing and trying to push back all the stuff. Uh -huh. Now, my theory about that is 
because I know just enough about psychology to be dangerous. Oh. And that is that we are victims of some sort of abuse. Because when all that happens and we keep pushing and pushing and pushing and pushing, trying to define a safe space, trying to find just who we are, and the stuff keeps coming at us. Mm -hmm. That is what happens to a person who has had somebody cross their boundaries. All right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's my concern with getting the church back to a movement which would be my term for authenticity, yeah. okay, rather than an institution. Mm -hmm. And the institution has wandered off into this boundary crossing, which is what's going on with all the latest discussions. They're boundary crossing, okay? Mm -hmm. Institutions are not allowed to stop the work of the Holy Spirit, period. Right, which is why Ellen White didn't want to buy property, right? If right. I remember yes history correctly <laughs> but yeah i what was your question specifically i got my brain went well, in 12 different well, directions my my real question is i listen to you is I, I love your energy and i love your focus but i hear you pushing back pushing back mm -hmm. uh, trying to get some rest uh, you're driven you're a workaholic. You're a, I don't know what you are, okay? You have to confess that yourself. Okay. No, you know. I think okay. you nailed it. <laughs> All right. So from, I'm, my name is Jim, and I'm a workaholic, too. Okay. That's why Dan right. and I are past retirement age, and look at where we are. We're still doing this. because we Absolutely. We All right. Oof. That's off the chest. Okay. So, uh, but in my older age... I have been able to just push all the stuff away, name it as boundary crossing and say, no, here's my boundaries. And if you don't like it, okay, God bless you. Put, put, put another sentence or two on the boundary crossing, Jim, real quick, just in case anyone's listening. I'm not completely clear yet what you mean. Okay, boundaries are all the important things that help people define who they are, uh, emotions, physical space, thoughts, uh, time, energy, you are and you have the right to define what, where, when, how anybody crosses any of those boundaries, including physical space, touch, love. There are so many different boundaries and one of them is truth or how you come to Jesus. Sometimes in the Adventist churches we're talking about baptism, the only way to come to Jesus is by a doctrinal approach and standing up front and saying blah, 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 blah. No, Jesus comes to you so many different ways. And right. it is authentic, it is real, and he calls a person into a relationship with him. That's all I care about. Is Jesus calling them into a relationship and I'm good? So I just want to say what an incredible blessing. You know, I think that comes with wisdom and age is the not reacting to the other super like extra stuff right yeah. because if you think about where my generation is i am incredibly fortunate because i think one i'm pretty stubborn and two i've never really cared about right. other people like i like other people and their thought processes but it doesn't determine my thought process and it never has and i've been very fortunate and also cursed with that um but at the same time, the thing is, is if you look at a lot of my generation um, and a little bit below my generation, they've never had the opportunity to understand this in a healthy manner or even in an unhealthy manner. They've only ever seen it pitted against each other, being torn down, pick a side, here's where you're going to hell, here's where you're going to be successful, here's where, and it's all the other superfluous things that have been the focus of the conversation. They haven't gotten gospel message. They've gotten all the other stuff. And so how do we expect them to hold on to the gospel message if the other stuff has been the thing that's been the focus of religion for the last 20 years? Well, so I, I can't be mad. I studied theology. I learned the ancient languages. I got my master's in divinity. I've spent my time in the church. I spent my time in the hospitals. So I feel like if I, my point, I can't figure it out. Okay, maybe that's me. Um, but everyone else, I just feel so bad. 
and I can't ever be mad at them because they haven't been introduced to a healthy religion. That's a very insightful statement. And it, and it genuinely breaks my heart. And this is where I, I think I've told Dan this at least a hundred times. I feel like I'm an old man because in my head, I'm like a 90 year old. That's like, well, these young people, what are we going to do about them? You know? And it's like, I'm that young person. I just <laughs> like forgot I was. And I, it breaks my heart because there's so much hope and so much beauty in Adventism, but we've never allowed them to see that part. I've been told to go back and put pantyhose on in 95 degree weather because that's what you wear to church. And I was nine. <laughs> and I, I'll remember that to this day because I was so hot. I remember being so hot and being like, what? <laughs> Why? <laughs> like I'm sweating profusely and I'm gonna climb a tree in about 20 minutes. So like, this doesn't make any sense. But like, that was the culture and that was what needed to be done. And my dad being the saint he is said, let's go get them. You can still play in the tree after. And he knew I'd get in trouble for playing in the tree, but he wanted to make sure that at least step one was taken care of. And I think like, if that's the childhood I remember, I can only imagine what other people remember because I have so many other good things thrown in there too. And so I can't be mad, but I also makes me really sad because I don't know how to save it. I don't know how to suddenly show up with a perfect healing plan. With the same, the same series in Manila, where they talked to you about the dress you had on, remember? Yeah. And they took six of Andrew's songs away with his background for the sax. Yeah. But I also had the three Filipino sisters from our church that were there, mm -hmm. and for the first time, they had gone to a meeting where they didn't feel scared and bad and unworthy mm -hmm. after the meeting. One of my favorite compliments in my life. Mm -hmm. They heard an Advent, a series of messages that made them love God and feel safe with him and comfortable with God. Mm -hmm. So I think there is a way to push that other stupidity away. And, and somehow there's a God that is embracing and is inclusive. And, and I think that's God. where, and I think that's where advocating for people comes in. And I think, you know, I don't know you incredibly well, Jim, but I know Dan has, I've always appreciated that he listens. Even when he disagreed with what I was saying or with what someone was saying, he would give it a shot and he would listen. Um, and I think that's the biggest testament you can give to someone is saying like, well, I heard you. Here's why I can't agree with you, but it's okay to not agree with me. You know, and I think like that's a grace filled moment. And I think religion in our church has for so long um, had really successful pockets. And then we try to mirror that everywhere. Um, the reality is, is you can't replicate authenticity. It has to be to this place it's at. It needs to be in the skate park accidentally on a Tuesday. You know, like that's where the people happen to be the freest and they all happen to be there and all happen to be curious about God. So just do Bible study in the skate park on Tuesday. But as soon as you say, oh my word, skate park ministry is a thing, let's try it here. Um, but Tuesday's a little busy for us or it has to be on a Tuesday or whatever it may be. You can't, you can't replicate authenticity. So, so you're not like, gonna franchise those moments. You but, shouldn't try. But what, what, what is the generalizable principle? Is embrace those moments when they come and there's a chance to listen, to, to be open to moments of conversation with people to listen to what they're saying. I mean, what, tell me the generalizable principle. I feel like I'm gonna get in so much trouble for all the things I've already said. Um, so I, this is where my anti-establishment rebellion child problem comes in, where my parents are probably gonna shake their head if they ever watch this, is this, I think this is where funding becomes a problem. My generation doesn't wanna tithe because they don't see the point of it, because all it's doing is going back into churches that don't seem relevant to them or going overseas to projects that they don't think are relevant. When they know that people need clean water, they know that people need food, they, know, they don't need another physical structure, right? Theoretically. So the problem then becomes if, if people are trying to replicate things, right? That's obviously not gonna work. But you can't also expect people to naturally be brilliant, creative people that are super aware, especially with a lot of the training that we go through in our personal programs for theology right? 
we have what one course on counseling we have what one course on financial management if we're lucky and then you expect people to go out and do all these amazing things and they don't know how to do that and so we set them up for failure immediately um and so my thing is is i think learning how to take people's super strengths and empowering them having wise people say like this isn't going to look like normal ministry, but I, you have an incredible skill. And someone who's not ordained, someone who's just passionate about Jesus and something bizarre that brings people together, that's ministry to me. And I think we've for so long focused on the degrees, the pedigree, the how you look, how well you speak, whether you can do it in a church, and whether we can dump money into it and label it very clearly Seventh-day Adventism. And I think that's where it gets really messy. Um, and I... I don't have a great solution. I just know that, I mean, if you look at Acts, if you look at the entire New Testament, I mean, the reason it grew and was so amazing was because people did it their way. They did it with their own resources. They did it with something they were passionate about. And I will forever remember this church I was part of. It was a non-denominational church. Don't worry, I went to church on Saturday too. I just needed good music on Sunday. Um, so I would go to this non-denominational church and the pastor and I became really good friends because he was... Um, raised pretty traditional in a different denomination and was curious on my denomination's view on women. Um, and then we ended up in all these side conversations about ministry and their policy. And it was the most beautiful healing. Like, I, I don't even know. They don't hire pastors. They don't pay pastors. So I wrote an entire paper on this, why you shouldn't pay a pastor. And it was this paper, not because I didn't think people deserve to be paid, but it was because we go to school forever to become a pastor and then we have no other resource. Um, but his model was, if you're passionate and you show up and you do all this stuff and you're investing all of your time and energy into this, let me free you up from your job so you can do ministry and I'll pay you for that. Um, and then if you have a baby, if you get married or if you have a, an emotional meltdown or if you're having an existential crisis and can't figure out the meaning of life anymore, you can take six months off and go back to whatever your career was because you have a career. Then we eliminate the burnt out, angry people that stand in our pulpits and have very strong opinions about things, but they don't actually care, but they can't do anything else and they need to pay their bills. And I think it's just like really complicated full swing, but it's a, if you think about the healing nature of the other model, oh my word, like, yeah. We should, we should at least ask one minute about Project Propel, which oh. you kind of have been leading up to. Uh, so, so I, yes, I know what it is. Uh, I, I like what you just said, okay? I want to make sure you, that doesn't just drop out there like a bomb <laughs> or something. Okay? Yes, yeah, I'm used to no, rambling and... I'm, I'm giving up the power, just, so... And now we're going to transition, transition over to what Dan wants to ask about. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. I thought I had a segue, but go ahead. No, no, I just wanted to affirm. What did you hear that you went to follow up? So, what is Project Propel? I don't know anything about it. You want to take one minute? Sure. How did you, um, how did the four girls, why mm -hmm. did you start it? So, again, I am, for all the junk I give my life and complain about, I am probably the luckiest person on the planet because I have the coolest friends. Like, I somehow found these treasures trove of people and I put them in my pocket life and I'm just so lucky um so when I was in college I guess one of my friends Elizabeth and I always used to joke that one day we would start a nonprofit, but it had to be meaningful because we wanted it to change the world right you know like this very like I don't know we just had these grand ideas she's um, uh, um we should talk sorry uh you're your video is breaking up, so oh. go ahead. It's back. Does it work now? Yes, it's working now. Okay. Um, so anyway, so we always had these grandiose ideas of how we would help the world, and we started the Rotaract Club in college so we could be part of the Rotary team, and we could, like, get funding for fun nonprofits. And as time went on, we, you know, we continued down the spiral of how can we impact people, and she was studying a master's in public health. Um, Amanda was um, doing, working on prosthetics degree, and then... Anyways, we all had our own little niche. And I remember one day Elizabeth just called me and she was living in the Philippines and Amanda was doing prosthetics at a hospital. And she was like, Sarah, I can't step over one more person. And I was like, what? And she was like, I just can't step over another person that is broken and starving and has nothing. And she kind of broke down and she's like, I think we're supposed to start something here. 
Um, and I was like, okay. And she just was already doing little things in the community. And as time went on, um, it was really amazing because people from all different pockets of my life, but I wasn't even, I'm not the CEO of Project Hell. that's Elizabeth. Um, but Elizabeth and I went to elementary school um, when I came to the US briefly. And um, we went to the same elementary school, so we met then. Amanda and I went to high school together. And then Roberta, I was her girl's dean, and then later we were roommates in life. And so all these people were from different pockets of my life that somehow without even me bringing them all together, we all found each other like five to 10 years later. And so now we have a nonprofit. Um, I have the privilege of being on the board because I can't live there. Um, and it's this incredible opportunity. It started out where we thought we were gonna be doing like public health things and working with prosthetics and doing art and livelihood programs that involve people transforming rubbish into art to sell because I was an art major. Um, and we had all these ideas and then it kept getting more and more simplified when we started realizing the needs of the community and we kept saying like eat healthy and here's why this will benefit you in the long term health wise and then we realized that they're in an impoverished community in an informal settlement and they have no access to fresh water to any vegetables they eat roadkill it's called twice dead so they cook it again because that's the closest thing to like nourishment that they can get um, and they just have zero resources, and they're brilliant. In Manila, you're in Manila. Mm -hmm. So we're in Manila. Hotel. We do urban gardens. We do eco bricks. We're like a hub for eco bricks. So people take their old bottles, like Coca Cola bottles, and fill them with all the plastic rubbish that everything comes in. You know, your little um, everything of shampoo, everything. You just rinse it off, clean, and put it in there. And then they make these bricks. We can build houses and fences and floating gardens out of them. Um, and gardens are on walls, Jim. Um, mm -hmm. I know there's a Manila habit, but they're on walls. They have all these bottles and things up the wall. The sidewalks mm -hmm. are filled with gardens. Mm -hmm. They help dig the dirt out. Mm -hmm. Unbelievable hard work. You did. Uh, you trudged off a lot of that dirt. And now we're working with indigenous tribes that have been kicked out of their property and helping with farming on tribe land. Um, because a lot of them don't have the resources because they keep getting pushed further and further and further out. And so we have um, eco farms going up as well, helping a lot of the tribes figure out how to kind of keep things moving. And so, and we also have eco wings dealing with a lot of the female challenges, you know, when you can't afford to buy the products you need. Um, and it's, it's just, it's a beautiful thing. Every time we turn a corner, something incredible happens and the girls like Elizabeth and Amanda and Roberta, they're just these geniuses who care so much and are too dumb to know that it's impossible. And so they keep doing things that people keep saying, you shouldn't be able to do that with 20 bucks. And they're like, watch us. <laughs> so you, know, you, you went into villages and you asked them what they needed and you began oh, to sure. fashion things. And it's we, a change to each situation as you find it. Absolutely. We, we went in originally and we're like, we're going to, to do these amazing things and then we realized we were we were dumb and ignorant and the reality is they tell you what they need and they're smarter than you you just have to come up with an idea like oh so girls are getting kicked out of school because they get their period okay let's figure out a way of making this sustainable because you can't afford the products you need so then we made a model and they were like yeah here's a better one and they made it better um, and now they have ownership of eco wings. And then same with urban gardens. We're like, here, we're YouTubing how to garden in Manila. And we started like a couple plots and then they took it away. And now they're just geniuses doing their own thing. And it's just really finding out what people need and where their heart aches and then finding resources and not doing it yourself. They have to do everything themselves. We supply it, we show up, we cheer for them, but we are not clearing the land for them. We are not gathering all of the supplies because for us it's about the empowerment of them being part of it and them owning it because if we die tomorrow or for some reason we're not allowed back in manila ever because of covid we want to make sure it's sustainable um so i've just been so lucky so project propel is if you ever want to check it out we just launched our new website it's amazing <laughs> well, just to tell you a story that i don't think i've told you uh hilda and i were with the watts ralph watts and his wife mm -hmm last year and I go every week now and help him write this book but anyway we were in his house when he said I have given my life to helping men and I have done men stuff all over the world I am done with helping men women have been downtrodden all through history and I'm going to give the rest of my life for women mm -hmm. so he's doing clinics everywhere uh, 
you know, that he takes money and he gives it to the system. He gives it to ADRA or mm -hmm. to systems in order to build those clinics for women. Mm -hmm. But in the Philippines, he gave it to Project Propel. So, I know. Uh, I'm, I, I can hardly wait till that gets done. I hope it all gets, you're working oh, on the clinic, it's, right? It's amazing. I, yeah, I like freaked out when I saw Ralph. Last time I was like, oh my word. And my favorite was, is I texted him a question about Hawaii and he sent me a picture of himself standing in front of my mural I painted at one of the gardens. And he was like, look where I am. And I was like, I'm sorry, what just happened? <laughs> like I was, where are you? And he, you know, it's just beautiful to see people join in. And this is where like, I'm an accidental feminist. I've never been like women, ah, you know, like that's never, I grew up with mostly boys and but I think there is there is a forgotten voice out there. And I think those that can speak, I think need to speak when the time is right. And I think if, especially if it doesn't serve you. Um, for me, I'm fortunate enough to have a house, so I'm not living in an informal settlement. So that gives me a voice to speak for the people saying like, hey, we need to be more aware of what's going on um, and listen to what they're saying so we can support them where they're at and not claim to have all these concepts of it. Um, and I think that's where it just gets beautiful is is when we can be those support systems and those founding blocks and those cheerleaders and those people that advocate um when no one knows how like they don't know how to advocate for them themselves i mean what i i just to give me my own thing I, I i love the blend that is in you sarah that we've heard tonight is that is that you know we know the social justice and the activism but there's a following jesus there's a spiritual side and i i am a follower of jesus and there's belief and there's love and there's gospel, but it's, it's never all by itself. It is very linked to the rest of this life. And you, Jesus embodied that. He had teaching. He wanted to tell us about God. He had teaching. He did it. He did acts of love mm -hmm. and he was out there doing it in life. It was always this boat. And, and you have, you have blended the two. Terrific. Terrific. Well. Um, I Thank you. Try, I would like to follow. Everyone would agree. <laughs> would you please give us your website? You said you had a new website. What is it? Oh, yeah, it's projectpropel.org. So uh, how do you spell that? P-R-O-J-E-C-T and then propel, P-R-O-P-E-L dot O-R-G. Um, so it's about empowering and moving people forward. So the propelling forward. Um, and pulling people out from where they're at and also celebrating where people are at because some of those places are incredible. Um, so, yeah. And these young women are the best because you're doing, you're doing what we're trying to do, social entrepreneurship. Use the one life you have to somehow max, a, max her out and make do something to make an impact on the world. And yeah. you're doing it. So anyway, yeah. Jim, any last words? No, just very nice to meet you and hear your enthusiasm. God is, God is using you big time. Thank you. Yeah. Well, thank you guys. I know it's, uh, y you guys are being renegades by having these kinds of conversations in some senses. In other senses, it's a normal conversation for you. So um, I just thank you for caring about the generation that doesn't know what they're supposed to believe in or how to believe in it. Well, we, we love talking to you. We love listening. We love the church. And we ache for the church to listen to this, to you, yeah. and to Sam, and to these young people. Uh, we gotta hand it off, because we're gonna be done. We gotta hand it off. We don't hand it off well. Uh, anyway, then the church dies. So we love your version, Sarah. Well, uh, you had we, want, we always ask you to say a little prayer for the church, for your generation, uh, before we're done. Oh yeah, for sure. Let's go ahead and pray. Dear God, I just wanna thank you for this moment, for this conversation. Um, I know there's a lot of moving pieces and a lot of fragmented pieces, but God, we know that you're the ultimate healer, that you show up in bizarre moments, that you somehow heal the impossible. And God, I just ask that you continue to show up. We know that you're out there. We know you're part of this church, but we ask that you bring wisdom and brilliance into the spaces that need it and grow us where we need to grow and break us where we need to break. Thank you so much for loving us. In your name, amen. Amen.